Well, good morning. This is Barry O'Dell with the Church of Christ at Mammoth Spring Facebook page. It's Tuesday morning, November 14th, 2023. Hope everybody's doing all right today. We're back to our study of the Minor Prophets, as you noticed. I don't know. Maybe you did, maybe you didn't. This is our 36th video on the Minor Prophets that we've been doing, working our way through that study. And we are in Malachi today. Still in Malachi, chapter 1. We introduced it last week. Didn't go live yesterday. Had a doctor's appointment. So, we are back today. As always, if you have any questions or comments, use the comment section. And I will address them when I see them. We're cross-posted onto the nearchurches.com Facebook page. And once the stream is over, I will upload this content to our YouTube channel, Mammoth Spring Church of Christ. So, Anyway, good morning, Anna. Good to see you. Others watching and not commenting, that's perfectly fine. Those so There's some always on the Near Churches Facebook page. There's Gail. Good to see you. <coughs> All right, well, here we are, Malachi chapter 1. As we, discussed, as, as we discussed the last time we were together, Malachi is what we would call the end of Old Testament history, going into the intertestament period. He's writing around 450 B.C. approximately. And Israel has, I guess you would say, gotten into the problem of ritualism, formalism, going through the, going through the motions. They may be going through the motions, but what they're doing is not right. Hey, Lyle, good to see you. And so that's the message of Malachi. Now, we looked at the first five verses last time we were together when we introduced the book, and the point that is made in Malachi chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, is that God loves Israel, God chose Jacob, and we spent some time on that phrase, Jacob I have loved and Esau I have hated, in Malachi chapter 1, verse 2 and 3. We explained what that meant. Hey, Miss Anita, good to see you up there in Ohio. Hope you guys are doing well. God chose to fulfill his promises to Abraham through Isaac and then through Jacob and through the 12 tribes, etc. And so if you want to have a good, well, good, if you, if you want to hear my take on that and what Scripture says about it from Genesis 25 and from Romans chapters 9 through 11, we covered that in the first video. We're going to start in verse 5 today, uh, rather verse 6. We finished in verse 5 last time. So he, gets, he starts getting to the point now. Okay, so I chose you. I've done all these things good for you. And one of the things we talked about in the last video is that last phrase in Malachi 1.5. The Lord is magnified beyond the border of Israel. And we talked about the, the sovereignty of God over everybody. He's the God of everybody, not just a few select people. Same thing's true today. Malachi 1.6. A son honors his father, and a servant his master. If I, if then I am your father, where is my honor? You know, that was part of the covenant of Moses, part of the Ten Commandments, as we call them, back in Exodus chapter 20 and Deuteronomy chapter 5. Honor your father and mother, that it may be well with you, and you may live long upon the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Well, if... <laughs> You think of the importance of that, one of the Ten Commandments, how much more important would it be to show the proper honor and respect to God? Where is my reverence if I'm your master, says the Lord of hosts, to you priests who despise my name? And that's one thing that you'll see as you read through the book of Malachi. The priests are discussed several times and their role. See, they, so they came back from captivity. We've covered that extensively. Rebuilt the temple, reinstituted sacrifice, got all that going back. Idolatry has been done away with. Now the problem is just going through the motions. It's kind of like, to me, it's kind of like in Revelation chapter 2, the church at Ephesus left her first love. It's kind of the idea here that we encounter in Malachi. The priest who despise God's name. Well, you say, yet you say, in what way have we despised your name? And then he, then he enumerates why that is the case. You know, not doing what God's Word says is obviously disobedience. Scripture calls it, refers to it as rebellion in 1 Samuel chapter 15. That's 
when Saul was told to destroy the Amalekites, and he just he didn't do it. That's rebellion against God. So when you disobey what God has revealed in His Word, you actually hold God in contempt. It's not just that you are not obedient. It's a reflection of your mindset toward God Himself. And that's, that's something I think we need to, all of us, need to think a little more clearly about. You offer defiled food on my altar, but say, in what way have we defiled it? Well, God was very specific. I've got a couple things written here in the margin of my Bible. Leviticus 22, Deuteronomy 15, passages. Hey, Michelle, good to see you. All these passages under the old law that talk about the sacrifices that were required on the altar, and they were to be, that they were very specific, and those specific instructions were to be followed. And if you didn't sacrifice what or how God sacrifice, uh, God commanded, then it's absolutely worthless. There's no good to it at all. It doesn't matter your intentions. And again, I've, so I've already referred to Saul once in 1 Samuel chapter 15. He was told to utterly destroy the Amalekites, everything. He comes back with the sheep, the oxen, the king, remember King Agag, and he comes back so proud of himself, and he says, See, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. And Samuel says, Listen, Saul, if you obeyed the voice of the Lord, why do I hear all these animals coming up behind you? And why is the king of the Amalekites here? You, you didn't. And when you get down to 1 Samuel 15, verses 22 and 23, he says that rebellion is just like witchcraft. You better, you're better off to obey the voice of the Lord than to bring all these animals that you claim you're going to sacrifice to God. Just do what God says do. Well, the priests in Malachi's day hold God and hold the sacrifices for God. As uh, verse 7 says, the table of the Lord is contemptible. It's not worthy of my respect. That's what, in so in terms of worship, all right, since that's what we're talking about contextually here, worship under the old law, those sacrifices, bring that idea into the New Testament. Are we permitted, is man permitted to worship any way he chooses today because he feels it's right? Because, you know, hey, this is my family tradition. This is the way I was brought up. My parents taught me. Their parents taught them, etc. Those things are not the standard of right and wrong. And when we disobey God's word, whether it's whether our disobedience comes from, maybe it's something like that, like we've inherited a, a family tradition. And so it's not that a person, hey, Miss Janie, good to see you. It's not that a person is, you know, like they're looking to disobey God. They're looking to change what God's words. It, it may not be that at all. Maybe it's just an ignorance of Scripture. You know, it's just, hey, I've always done it this way. I've never really looked into it. Even if that is the case, we don't have the right to alter what God's Word says. And if we do, we hold God in contempt. That's ultimately what it gets down to. Ignorance is no excuse Tradition is no excuse. You're either doing what God says do, or you're not. And so the Israelites, the priests specifically, uh, verse 6, they were intentionally holding God in contempt. They, they felt he was not worthy of respect. When you offer the blind as a sacrifice, is it not evil? Well, yeah, it's evil, because in those sacrifices, God required the top. He required the very best. And it's not just that he required the very best. He's worthy of the very best. He was then, he is now. When you offer the lame and sick, is it not evil? These questions obviously answer themselves. All right, I tell you what. If this is the way you're going to do me, then offer these same things to your governor. Offer these same types of gifts to your leaders. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you favorably, says the Lord of hosts? Well, of course not. Then what Malachi does, or rather what God does through Malachi, verse 9, But now entreat God's favor that he may be gracious to us while this is being done by your hands. So you're, you're acting in these disrespectful, rebellious ways, and then you want to come to God and ask for his blessing. And his response to that is, Will he accept you favorably, says the Lord of hosts? Well, again, that question would answer itself. No, he does not. And so as you 
continue reading this chapter, you have that, you know, God, God would prefer no sacrifice. I see that in verse 10. Listen to verse 10 here. Who is there even among you who would shut the doors? Talking about the doors of the altar, the doors of the temple where the sacrifice is made. So that you would not kindle fire on my altar in vain. And that's the key. That's why, that's why we know what Malachi is saying here. Who would offer, or kindle rather, fire on my altar in vain. It would be better to shut the doors to the temple and not offer anything at all than to willingly and knowingly offer God inferior sacrifices. That's the point that we're making here. I will not accept an offering from your hands, verse 10. Just, you know, just quit. It's, kind of, it's, in, it's very similar to Isaiah. Isaiah is approximately 300 years prior to Micah, or rather Malachi. You read Isaiah chapter 1, God said, I hate your new moons and your Sabbath feast. I hate your sacrifices. I'm not going to accept them. Hey, Brian, good to see you. So, they're in the same condition now, but the Gentiles, he says, this is interesting, Malachi chapter 1, verse 11, from the rising of the sun, even to its going down, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. The Jews are taking it for granted. They're not doing what God would have them to do. They're not living like his people ought to live. The Gentiles will, though. In every place incense shall be offered to my name and a pure offering. For my name shall be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. I think that's looking more into the messianic aspect of prophecy. Because in order to offer sacrifices properly under Judaism, well, you had to follow Judaism. You had to follow the Jewish law. And so a, a Gentile could convert to that. But anyway, I think that's a, a messianic idea there in Malachi chapter 1 and verse 11. He gets right then back to their sacrifices and the table of the Lord, verse 12, it's, they had profaned it. They had defiled it. The table of the Lord is defiled. Its, its fruit is contemptible. It's a weariness, verse 13. They were just tired of serving God. All right, they're still offering sacrifices. They're not offering the right kind. Their heart certainly isn't in, into what they're doing. And so I think that's the point going back up into verses 9 and 10. Just stop. Just shut the doors. Be done with it. Because what you're doing right now is not doing you any good. Hey, Miss Connie, good to see you. And again, that that lesson can be pulled over for us today in in the Lord's church. If if we're just going through the motions, what whatever, whether we're talking about the assembly on the Lord's Day or your Christian life in general, hey, Miss Sheila, good to see you. If you're just going through the motions and your heart is not in what you're doing and you're not really seeking more knowledge from God's Word so that you can... I don't know if improves the right word, but so that you can do better, then just quit. What's the point? If if you're not going to put any effort into it, if your heart's not in it, it's been it's not it's not honoring God, and it's certainly not benefiting you. Now, I think there are a lot of parallels that we could draw from Malachi chapter one, and the way they viewed worship, uh, and and what we can the traps that we can fall into today as Christians. It's a weariness. You sneer at my sacrifices, verse 13. You bring the stolen, the lame, the sick. That's what you bring to offer God. It'd be better just to knock it off. Just quit. But cursed be the... Dis now, then he points this out, Malachi 1, 14. Then we'll, we'll, st we'll start chapter 2 today, but we won't get all the way through it. But cursed be the deceiver who has a male in his flock and takes a vow. The, the idea here is in Malachi 1.14, somebody in Israel or people in Israel, they have the proper sacrifice. They have a male, and of course it's a male of the first year. It's the, you know, without blemish, etc. Yes, exactly. David Stambersky says, checking the box. A lot of people are, just guilt of, are guilty of just checking the box. I came to church. I sang the songs. Um, I'm a nice person. Yeah, so what? Is your heart in what you're doing? Yeah, checking the box is not going to get you anywhere. But anyway, back to Malachi 1.14. The deceiver is a person who has a male in his flock. He has the proper sacrifice is the point. But sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished. God is worthy of, and he demands our best. He has every right to demand our best. And so I would say we could all do better. Certainly the people, the priests in particular, 
of Malachi's day could have done better and should have known better. And that's kind of where chapter 2 goes. So we'll just move right into chapter 2 here. And now, O priest, this commandment is for you. If you will not hear, and if you will not take it to heart. See, that's the key right there, Malachi 2.2. 2. And if you will not take it to heart. Okay, you can know what the, the priest knew the law. All right? You can know what God's Word says. But if you don't take it to heart, if you don't allow it to change, well, it's like Paul says, is it Romans chapter 1 and verse 11? I can't remember what verse it is off the top of my head. But anyway, he talks about the God whom he serves with the inner man. It's not just the externals. It's not just what you do with your physical body. It's the inner man that you, from which you serve God. And it's, of course, manifested, obviously, through your physical body. But you got to take it to heart. To give glory to my name, says the Lord of hosts, I will send a curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings. Yes, I have cursed them already, because you do not take it to heart. So he says it twice in Malachi 2.2, 2, the importance of taking things to heart. Having the proper mindset, mentality, however you want to say it, and then serving God properly. Christianity, I think a good way to, thinking about us today, okay, moving out of Judaism and Malachi, thinking of us today, Christianity, Christianity is a religion, I've heard it said, of both the head and the heart. Okay, you have to know and believe the right things, but you have to have the right heart as you do those things. And you can do it one way or the other. You can have the right heart and not serve God according to what Scripture says, but then you can also serve God the way Scripture says, but not have the right heart. You've got to have both, and it's not impossible to have both. I tell you what, here's a great... Uh, a great example of this. I'm turning over to Matthew chapter 23. When Jesus was in the temple and rebuking the scribes and Pharisees. Let me see if I can find it here real quick. Here we go. Matthew 23, 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin. Okay, so they're, they're doing the tithing that the law required. That's not a bad thing because, well, the law requires it. But you have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. So that tells me I can do both. I can serve God based on what's revealed in his word, and I can do it with the right heart. I can take it to heart, as Malachi 2.2 2 says. But if I'm, if I'm doing one of the two, I'm still coming up short. I, you know, I... I Another passage I think of is, again, in your New Testament, he is over in Ephesians chapter 4, where Paul says, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. All of that is internal. It's your mindset. It's how you do things. That's, again, Ephesians 4, 1 through 3. But then you get to verse 4, there's one body. And if you know Ephesians, the body is the church. There's one church. I have to know that internally, but I also have to practice that properly externally. Okay, not every church that exists who claims Jesus as Lord, who claims God as Father, is the church. Because Jesus died for one. He purchased his church with his blood. And Paul says there is one body. There's one hope, there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. So I have, to, I have to have both, the right internals and the right externals. And from what Jesus said there to the Pharisees in Matthew 23, 23, I know that both the internals and the externals can be done. This is not impossible. And I think that just goes back to our mentality. If our heart is right, if we're wanting to do the right things, we can do the right things with the right attitude. All right? Hopefully that makes some sense there. Anyway, back to Malachi chapter 2, back to his rebuke of the priests, verse 3. I will rebuke your descendants and spread refuse on their faces, the refuse of your solemn feast. That's an interesting word. Sometimes, and it's a contextual word, sometimes in the Old Testament it refers to like what we would refer to as dung or manure. I think contextually here, though, and this is another definition of the word, would be the internal organs. So they're offering these animal sacrifices and they process them, if you want to use that term. Like when I kill a deer, I process the deer. I field dress it, cut it up, quarter it, things like this. 
the, the refuse here is probably a reference to something like that. Their internal organs. The, the stuff that was um, not necessarily used in sacrifice and things like this. But uh, it's going to be spread on your faces. It's going to be a... <clears throat> What you're offering as sacrifice is going to be an indication of what I think of your sacrifice. Yeah, Connie says we can't have one and not the other and be pleasing to God. That's right. It's impossible. Anyway, one will take it away, and one will take you away with it, the refuse, the, the worthless stuff, whether it's, again, the dung or the internal organs of the sacrifices, whatever the case may be. Then you shall know that I have sent this commandment to you, that my commandment with Levi may continue. And again, that's, that's the specificity of the law. When you go back to the Pentateuch and you read the requirements of the priests, their personal cleansing and preparation for their work in the priesthood, when you read about the sacrifices, the instruments, the altar, everything that went into it, God revealed that to them, and God expected them to do that. And they, well, they weren't. Verse 5, he says, My covenant with him, Levi, the priesthood, one of life and peace. And I gave and I gave them to him that he might fear me. So he feared me. And it, you know, it started out well, you might say, and was reverent before my name. The law of truth was in his mouth, and injustice was not found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and equity and turned many away from iniquity. And that's exactly what the priesthood was designed to do. But you keep reading. Verse 7, the lips of the priest, and notice how this is worded. I think this is important. For the lips of a priest should keep knowledge, and people should seek the law from his mouth, for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. But, and there's the key, but, it, it should be this way, but you have departed from the way. And again, this message, going back up to chapter 2 and verse 1, is to the priests. You have departed from his way. You have caused many to stumble at the law. You have corrupted the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore, I have made you contemptible and base before all the people, because you have not kept my ways, but have shown partiality in the law. And again, there are so many parallels, I think, that we can draw into Christianity from these messages that were written under the jurisdiction of Judaism. The, the, the importance of the inner man, the importance of the internals, just as much as the proper externals. And then here, the role of the priesthood. Well, so in New Testament Christianity, every Christian is a priest. Okay, so for instance, 1 Peter chapter 2 and verses 9 and 10. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. That's a Christian's responsibility. But if we are not living up to God's standard, we can't do any of that. We cannot be God's holy people. We can't be a royal priesthood. But we are expected to be. God expects us inwardly and outwardly, internally and externally, to serve Him according to His revealed will. Levi fell short in that, and by Levi I mean the priesthood in Malachi's day. Christians today can fall short of that too. It's like some people believe that that it just can't be done, that it's too hard to be done, that you just you can't please God. And I think that I think that's reflected and well maybe I think it's partly the fault of preachers and the way sometimes they preach. Because I, I've heard it many times over the years that, you know, hey man, we're all just sinners. We all fall short of the glory of God. And that's true to an extent, okay? That's true to an extent. But if that's your only view of what we are as Christians, then you have a totally imbalanced view of Christians. Yes. We sin. Nobody denies that. But that doesn't mean that you cannot be what God expects you to be and that you cannot do what God requires of you. That's not an out. Saying, saying something like, well, Romans 3.23 says we all sin is not an excuse to sin. And it's not an excuse to not try your best, to not have the proper internals and externals in your service to God. And by in your service to God, I mean how you worship on the first day of the week. But I also mean, and, and this is why I referenced Ephesians chapter 4, how you live from day to day, that you walk in lowliness and meekness with gentleness, long-suffering. 
it can all be done. And there's no secret to it. There's no, there's no mysterious help you have to have to, to change you internally because you can't change yourself. That's why we're called to repent. We have, a, I mean, we have a lot of responsibility. There's no question about that. But God, just like he did with the Levitical priesthood, he laid it out for them. He's very specific. Well, he's laid out for us what Christianity looks like, both by commandment, I would say, but also by example throughout, well, throughout the book of Acts and throughout the epistles. And this is what your life as a Christian should look like. Let's stop there for today. We'll come back tomorrow. And we'll pick up in Malachi chapter 2 and verse 10. That's what I've got, guys. Hey, I appreciate seeing you on here today. Appreciate the comments and the greetings. Good to be back. We'll come back tomorrow. And uh, like I said, what verse? Malachi chapter 2 and verse 10. Guys, thank you. Hope you have a good day. And hope to see you back here tomorrow at 11 Central.